are, we are truly in um, a very special moment in our church. And, uh, and because of that, I, I want to preach for a couple of weeks from this subject. This is a move. This is a move. This is a move. I guess we should have sang that t- tonight, huh? Yeah, we, my bad. Uh, <laughs> oops. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe at the end. Uh, uh, my bad. I forgot about that one. But uh, preparing for your greatest year, I believe 2020 is going to be your greatest year. <laughs> and I'm and I'm believing God, but and 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 I I didn't mean to, but all of 2019 I preached faith. I mean I just preached faith, 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 faith. And I want to bring you now to what's going to ensure your greatest year. It's going to need to be your greatest year spiritually. And so in the midst of Christmas time, December, I should be preaching on the manger and Joseph and Mary and the star. And, uh, but um, I'm not going to. I'm going to preach on revival <laughs> for, the next, uh, for the next few weeks. And I'm specifically talking about personal revival, though it, personal revival always bleed into corporate revival. Um, so when I say that, half of you say, I have no idea what revival means besides the fact that we do Sunday night revival nights at times. And the other half of you go, I know what a revival is, and you probably don't. So let me help both of you, okay? Revive. Re again, vive life. Life again. To experience revival is to experience life again in your own life. To experience spiritual life where your walk with God has grown cold and mundane and religious and um, just very much by the motions. God will breathe new life into your walk with God. You, you will have to. I, I've been walking with God now 21 years. You have to experience revival throughout your life. Where there's just times that you, like the prodigal son, you come to your senses and you go, I got to get back to my father's house. And I want us to live in a place of, of new life, revival, burning hot on fire for God. Now, um, I was raised in a church, though, where revival was like a certain meeting. So like, man, church was three hours. It was revival. No, just the preacher was long-winded, you know. Or revival was people got prayer and they fell out. That was revival. You know, anybody raised in that kind of, you ever see that? Maybe on YouTube, you know. (laughs) And, And by the way, we're not against that. We also don't want to manufacture it, though. So we go from these true manifestations where people actually are so overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit, they fall down, to where it actually becomes form and routine to where it's like, oh, is there a catcher? Is there a little lady with a blanket? Okay. And then they fall. <sighs> and, it, and what was beautiful, because that's happened to me. I'm one of those guys, if y'all want to know. I'm, I'm crazy. But... We don't force that because I've also been in meetings where it's like, oh, cool, the pastor is pushing. Okay, here we go. So we're never going to do that, right? So we're never going to manufacture it. But I was, I was raised in, and I thank God for it, in a church that was hyper, hyper charismatic. And what I mean by that, I mean, there was dancing, there was tongues, there was prophecy, there was ladies running around with flags and tambourines and people laughing and other people crying and other people making weird noises ah you know screaming and i mean it was wild and i i don't i'm not ashamed of it i'm actually thank god for it because it taught me to love the holy spirit but then i also saw when the when when god started doing a new thing and we couldn't get beyond it in our head so then we had to manufacture it so when i'm talking about revival let me give you revival are y'all ready revival is when the church returns to its first love its first works and its first call I'm talking about this is gonna bug me sorry it's okay I forgive you (laughs) bye Felicia Uh, (laughs) when the church returns to its first love its first works and its first call see there's this story where Jesus tells uh, a church in in Revelation 2 we're gonna study it next week Jesus tells the church he goes hey guys here's my I, I got an issue Here's the issue. You become a professional Christian. You, you're no longer hot or cold. You become lukewarm. 
and, and, and he said, here's what I need you to do. I need you to return to your first love. Get, get back to that passion for me. Where it's not just, okay, pastor says, lift your hands, lift your hands. Okay, pastor, shout, okay, shout. Okay, I guess I gotta give. Oh, I guess I gotta go to church, it's Sunday. But where you're on fire for God. And Jesus tells this church just one generation after the book of Acts. Hey, I, I want you to go back to that kind of love. And that's where I want our church to live. I want our church to, I don't want our church to, as our church grows, I don't want our church to outgrow what's happening right in this room right now. Right? So I don't want to get big and now we got a big building, we got big money, we got big people, and now we know how to do big church. No, no, no I want to have big faith and big prayer, big worship, big praise. Come on. Big passion. A big shout, a big clap, big music, big preaching, raising up big people to make a big impact. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. So, so that, that's what I'm believing God for because if we can experience personal revival, it will turn into corporate revival. And as one great old reformed preacher said, he said, if you would just get set on fire for God, if you would just get set on fire for God, people would come from miles away just to watch you burn. <sighs> I would love for City Light to be an absolute spectacle of God's glory in our city. That if nothing else, people could just come and go, whoa. So I'm going to give you the first key to personal revival today. And, uh, and I'm going to give you keys over the next few weeks. I'm not going to give you tips and handles and thoughts. I'm going to give you keys. I'm going to give you like super natural keys that will work today. Right? Like I, I have men in my life who give me maybe tips or they give me ideas or they give me wisdom but then I have apostolic men in my life who give me keys that like when they speak something it shifts something in my spirit what I'm going to do over the next three weeks I'm going to give you keys yeah and they're going to be better than anything DJ Khaled could give you I'm going to give you keys that will that will unlock something in the spirit over your life y'all ready for that so here's the first key today. We're going to talk about prayer and fasting. Where'd all the faith go? It's just... Oh, don't try now. It's too late. It's too late. Over here. Woo! That's no, okay. And I'm, I'm going to show you a few, a few thoughts about prayer and fasting. They're going, to un, they're going to unlock something in your life. So we're going to look at a scripture. This is Mark chapter 9, verse 17. Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and it becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. They could not. He answered him and said, Oh, faithless generation. By the way, he said that to his disciples. You know, that's an awkward moment. He looks at his 12 and says, y'all faithless. <laughs> Peter like hides behind Judas. He's like, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. So they brought him to him. And when he saw him immediately, the spirit convulsed and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming at the mouth. So he asked the father, Jesus says, how long has this been going on? It's been happening since childhood. And often he has been thrown into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Let me just say, this is what prayer and fasting does. You have faith. That's why you're here. You have some amount of faith you're here. But what prayer and fasting does is it releases faith where there is currently doubt. So some of y'all go, oh, I could believe for healing, but you can't believe for a relationship to be restored. Or I could believe for my marriage, but I cannot believe for my teenager. Or I can believe for my teenager, but I can't believe for finances. Or I can't. In other words, there's an area that you have faith. That's why you're in church. That's why they were gathered. But 
there is an area where they where the father said I, I don't have faith for that okay now I'm helping you because what prayer what you do with prayer and fasting is you laser focus on an area with prayer and fasting the weapons of your warfare and you release faith in that area okay um he rebuked the unclean spirit 25 and he said deaf and dumb spirit i command you come out of him and enter him no more notice that the father said he was mute jesus said it was a deaf and dumb spirit in other words jesus identified the the, the root cause what prayer and fasting does is why well, i'm just giving you a few things i'm going to teach prayer and fasting gives you revelation to see the actual issue that's going on so you're not living in a spiritual fog man i just i can't see it no what prayer and fasting does is it reveals the truth because jesus if you read the text earlier was on the mountain praying and fasting okay spirit cried out convulsed him greatly and came out of him and he became one as uh, as as one dead he was slain in the spirit he was overcome by the power of god and fell out so that many said he's dead <laughs> But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples privately, they, they whispered, they go, hey, Jesus, why couldn't we do that? Why didn't we have victory over that thing? Listen, listen, listen. I don't know where you don't have victory right now in your life, but you need to have that conversation with Jesus. Okay. And Jesus gives them the key. Y'all ready for it? He said to them, this kind. This issue can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. There's going to be issues in your life that can only be broken through prayer and fasting. Not everything, but this kind. Not every kind, but this kind. Not every situation in your life, but some situations. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you, and even as I'm just talking right now, I guarantee 99% of the room could go, yep, I know my, I know my thing. And so I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you the key today to, to break through. Father, bless your word now as we go to it in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen, amen, and amen. So I want you to notice uh, point number one, the work of the enemy. That, that the Bible said that, that the enemy had been, had been attacking this boy since his childhood. Um, I, I want to remind you that we do have an enemy. Yeah. Um, I know I'm a lot. Like, I just know I'm a lot. I'm just, I'm loud and I'm boisterous and I'm, and I preach about, you know, I just, I'm like, I'm just a lot. <laughs> I preach about money, preach about sex, preach about purity, preach about service. I preach, I just, I know I'm a lot and I'm loud and I, and I know our worship is a lot. You know, that was a lot for 35 minutes that we just did. That was a lot, you know, and I, I get it. But let me just remind you that the devil's a lot. And uh, the devil's aggressive. And an aggressive enemy is not going to be beaten by a passive church. And an aggressive enemy is not going to be exposed by a passive preacher. <sighs> so I get you for an hour, or if you're crazy and come on Sunday nights, an hour and a half a week. I'm going to give it to you straight, and I'm going to give it to you really passionately and i'm gonna give it to you as as hard as i as hard as i can preach it that's how hard i'm gonna preach it because i only have you for this sliver of time during the week and i'm and i'm hoping like i cannot give you a little glass of water i gotta open up the fire hydrant of the holy spirit and of the word and try to jar you to go wait a minute life isn't working the way i've been doing it and I'm, and I'm trying to expose you to the better way, the God way, the Zoe life, the life that's more abundantly. And I know I come across as a lot, and that isn't a show. That's my passion, uh, bleeding, saying, I'm begging you, don't play games with the devil because the devil is after you and he wants to destroy you. And, and I want you to catch this about the enemy. It's not like God is on God's team and the devil's on devil's team and God wants people on his side and the devil wants people on his side. Like God is for you. And God is for God. Like God is for his glory and he's for you and he's for your good. The devil is not for the devil. The devil is against all things. I want you to catch this. It's not like the devil wants you on his side. He doesn't have a side. All he has is destruction. 
He is, he, he is your opposer. He, he is constantly coming up against you to destroy you. And I, I'm just saying this because I want you to know that there, that like, because we can just, we can play with addictions and we can play with secrets and we can play with sins and we can play with strongholds and we think it's like our little thing and it's, and it's not that big of a deal, but the devil is, is after you to destroy you according to the text from your childhood. Wow, wow. So let me show you this in Psalm 143.3. For the enemy has pursued my soul. He doesn't want your car. He doesn't want your house. He doesn't want your money. He doesn't want your stuff. He doesn't want your shoes. He wants your soul. Because if he gets your soul, he gets your imagination. If he gets your soul, he gets your prayers. If he gets your soul, he gets your sleep. If he gets your soul, he gets your rest. If he gets your soul, he gets your faith. If he gets your soul, he gets your attention. If he gets your soul, he will eventually get your marriage. If he gets your soul, he will eventually attack your children. If he gets your soul, he will destroy every other part of you. So he's after the very core of who you are. What is he trying to do? He's trying to crush my life to the ground. He's trying to, he's trying to beat you down. He's trying to get you down. He's trying to break you down so that eventually you will be like those long dead. In other words, you will be isolated in darkness. This is what the enemy wants for you. He's got one mission and he's after your soul. He wants to break your faith. He wants to break your spirit. He wants to break your ability to believe God. That's why David would pray in Psalm 23, God, would you restore my soul because the enemy's pursuing my soul. So I need God to restore my soul because whoever gets my soul gets my future. And I'm, and I'm asking you tonight, to not take it lightly so that you can walk in everything God has for you. And I want you, to, I want you to see what the enemy did to this boy. By the way, we don't know why this even happened. Like, and I'm really grateful, by the way, that Jesus didn't show up to the father and was like, okay, so what, you know, what sins have you committed that have opened this door? What sins have your boy committed that have opened this door? Or you know, what have you guys been watching? Or, you know, have you guys been watching Disney Plus and it's satanic? No, 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 there was none of that. Because I think sometimes the devil just does devil stuff because he's the devil. And don't beat yourself up over, well, I sinned six months ago or I said something bad or I, or I looked at something wrong. Or I, Listen, you are where you are. Let's bring Jesus into the equation and get free. <laughs> Amen. So much of the deliverance ministry in the earth today is we need to renounce this and recant this and rebuke this and, and, and we need to say this and we need to say, and it's all incantation and it's a lot of it I'm just not into. I'm into Jesus. Here's where I am. Jesus, you're greater than the enemy. Jesus, do what only you can do. Amen. That's the, that's the kind of deliverance I'm into. But I want you to see what happens. This boy, first of all, the Bible said it would seize him. He would lose control. I just want to ask you, please don't answer out loud, but have you lost control? I just want, have you lost control? If you've, if you've lost control, it's time to pray and fast. If you've lost your ability to drive by that casino and you, can no, you no longer have control, the reins of your own life, and you have to stop. It's time to pray and fast. You can't drive by that dispensary without stopping or being tempted. It's time to pray and fast. You can't drive by a liquor store huh, huh, without being tempted. It's time to pray and fast. You can't, you can't get cut off on the road without going into a fit of rage. It's time to pray and fast. You can't have a normal confrontation in your home without it turning into something toxic. It's time to pray and fast. If you've lost control, and I don't know how to say that other, you know what that means, but if you feel like you've lost control today, if you can't look at someone without being overcome by lust, it is, it is time to pray and fast because don't give the devil the reins of your decisions. God wants to give you your control back. The fruit of the spirit is self-control, Galatians chapter 5 says. The Bible said that God has not given you a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Come on, you get the reins, but you get the steering wheel back. Jesus, take the wheel. Now, he ain't going to take the wheel, but he's trusting you to drive. The Bible said he was mute. Have you lost your voice? Have you lost your ability to pray? Have you lost your ability to pray in the spirit? Have you lost your ability to worship loud and freely? 
Have you lost your ability to be a witness at your workplace? Have you lost your ability to invite people to church? Yeah. Maybe it's time to pray and fast. Has the, does, has the devil taken your voice? Can you talk about anything but God? It's time to pray and fast. Number, here's another one. The Bible said that he, he w- became rigid. That's a word we don't really, he became rigid. It's a, it's a Greek word that means he was wasting away. Have you lost your strength? You sleep eight hours and you're still tired? You're trying to eat better, but you're still, you're still weak? Maybe there's some heaviness over your life. Maybe it's not physical. Maybe there's a spiritual thing happening in your soul. Are, are you wasting away? Do, do you feel like you're getting weaker and weaker, not stronger and stronger? The, the Bible said that the man said, Jesus, my boy's rigid. In other words, I don't even recognize him anymore. He just keeps getting more and more. He gets weaker and weaker and weaker, more and more broken. If, if, that's, if that's you right now, None of, this is, none of this is bad news. It's where you are. There is a key. Come on. This is good news. And the key is prayer and fasting. I'm going to show it to you, but the key is prayer and fasting. The Bible said it would throw him down. Do you feel down? Do you feel like you can't get up? Do you feel like, like, it, like every time you start to get momentum, you putter out again? It's time to pray and fast. You get inspired for two days and then you give up. It's time to pray and fast. You really start believing, and then you have another setback, and then that turns into six weeks. It's time to pray and fast. Man, I'm going to help you today. Okay. The man brings the boy to the disciples, number two, the powerless disciples. Uh, they could not help him. They, they could not help him, and they didn't know why they couldn't help him. So they had no power, and they had no answers. Oh, God, may that never be this church. No power, no answers, well-meaning, nothing's changing. Because they couldn't do it, and they didn't know why they couldn't do it, so they had to go to Jesus and say, why can't we do it? I'm believing that our church is not only going to be a place of love, and I believe it is, and it will only grow in that but I believe our church will be a place of power. Yes. Say amen. amen. I'm, I'm talking about Holy Ghost power. Amen. I'm talking about you need a miracle, you get over to City Light Church. You, need, you're, you can't sleep at night, you get over to City Light Church. You going through hell, you get over to that church. You don't believe in God, doesn't matter. You get over there, because some crazy person will lay their hands on you and things will change. They won't just love you, they'll pray for you, and the power of God is in the room. Come on, I want that kind of church. I want a church that's more anointed than it is excellent. I thank God for our lights, I thank God for our screens, I thank God for this beautiful band that is so amazing, and these amazing singers, but man, may it not just be good. May we be in here going, Jesus is here, and I don't want to leave, and the only reason I'm going to leave is to go help more people and get more people in here, because God's doing something here. Come on, say amen. I, I want a powerful church. Come on, I'm believing for a praying church, a church of answers, a church of the anointing, a church that can lay hands on anybody and see God do something. Not weird, not kooky, not religious, not tradition, real power. Real power. And the disciples couldn't do it. Number three, the supernatural answer. It was my favorite part of the text, Theo. Jesus did not say, hey guys, you couldn't cast, you couldn't do it because you're you weren't born of, born of a virgin like me. <laughs> hey Weston, you guys couldn't do it because you're not the son of God incarnate like I am. <laughs> now sit back and watch. <laughs> he didn't say, go ahead and sit on the sidelines and watch me. Drop 80 points. No, no, no. He said, he said, he said, he said, guys, you can do this too. But there's something I do that you don't do yet. By by the way, 
he had even said they didn't do it yet. Do you remember when John's disciples went up to him and were like, yo, why don't they fast like we got to fast? And Jesus said, oh, they'll fast. There will come a day when they will fast. It's just not time yet. Okay. (sighs) I feel Jesus right here. See, if he would have said that and not shown them this principle, they would have never known the power of it. What? Okay. He he says, here's how you do it. You pray and you fast. This became a Holy Ghost reminder to them because when you read the book of Acts, if you've never read, read the book of Acts, I beg you to do it this week, I beg you. When, when, they, when you're in the book of Acts, here's what you find all through the book of Acts. The apostles prayed and they fasted. They got a word from God and they did it. They prayed, they fasted, they got a word from God, they did it. They prayed, they fasted, they got a word from God and they obeyed over and over and over and over again. Why did they do it? They did it because they remembered this moment. They remembered when they were powerless, puny little disciples who had no spiritual authority. And they remembered when Jesus taught them the principle of fasting and prayer. So now, as those little disciples become glorious apostles, there's really only one thing that changes from the Gospels to the book of Acts. It's that the men of God learned to pray and fast. So they did nothing until they prayed. They didn't send anybody out till they prayed and fasted. They didn't make any decisions till they prayed and fasted. They actually got to the point, there's one story in the book of Acts where, where they needed to do some just routine church stuff and the apostles actually said, we can't go do that. We can't go feed the, the poor. We can't do that because we must stay committed to the ministry of the word. In other words, if we get busy doing the churchy stuff, and we leave praying and fasting, we'll lose all our power. So they actually had to anoint deacons, volunteers, a serve team. Because I can't be in the parking lot. I, 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 can't be, I can't be parking cars. I can't be. See, some of y'all get annoyed by that. You shouldn't. I can't be seating people and parking cars and helping in the children's ministry and then run up here and preach. I lose my power. What anoints me is my prayer and fasting. I have to stay faithful to the ministry of the word. So this group of deacons rose up and said, hey, we'll handle the details. Apostles, you pray and fast. So they remembered this moment because this was the moment that changed their ministry forever. Jesus said, I'm not doing this because I'm the incarnate son of God. I'm not doing this because I'm the second person of the triune Godhead. I'm not doing this because I'm the word made flesh. I'm doing this. I have power over devils because I pray and fast. And you can too. And you can. See, some things can be counseled. Some things just need more wisdom. Some things just need a good vacation. Some things just need a good conversation. Some, some, some things just need just little wisdom, just little things. But, but some things, this kind, require prayer and fasting. So do all you need to do in the natural, and you need to do all that. But there's some things that are going to require the supernatural intervention of heaven by prayer and fasting. Here, here's why fasting is important, because fasting goes beyond feelings. Um, we, we have this big temptation. We, people, and we, especially Americans, we have this big temptation to make faith ethereal. So we want to keep faith out here in the spirit. And yet faith is very much flesh and blood. So, so there's things that God calls us to do in the natural to show our faith. Well, Jabin, I feel humble. No, God says, bow down before me. <laughs> well, that would be awkward. Yeah, that's what makes it humbling. Well, Jamin, I feel generous. I, I, I paid for the car behind me at Starbucks. No, God says generosity is tithing. Let me talk to the 6 p.m. because y'all don't give. So let me talk to the 6 p.m. real quick. <laughs> let me talk to y'all real quick. Generosity is not tipping your waitress 20% instead of 18%. Generosity to God is tithe. I didn't say it. I didn't write the book. I just preach it. 
Can I, is, does that make sense to you? So like, well, I feel generous. Well, that's cool that you feel it, but there's actually a way you can know it. It's called the tithe. Okay, um, I feel like a worshiper. No, you sing and you lift your hands and you exalt the Lord with your voice. Well, I feel like a Christian. Faith without works is dead. <laughs> so we want to talk about roots that we cannot see. But every, every root system produces a fruit system. So I don't need to know about the hidden roots that I'll never see. I can just look at your fruit. And, and you're saying you're an apple tree, but homie, those are oranges. How do you like them apples? <laughs> so all I got to do is look at the fruit. Uh, here's, here's what I'm saying. The dad wanted the boy healed. The disciples wanted the boy healed. They had desire, but they did not have faith. You actually have to desire it enough to do something in the natural to see breakthrough. They wanted the boy healed, but they didn't have faith. Jesus did not say, you guys don't even care about this kid. No. They cared. They just didn't have faith. I'm not saying, yeah, you know what? You're in the issue you're in because you don't have faith. You need more faith. No, no, no. Because Jesus did not say they needed more faith. They, he said, you have no faith. Listen, they had no faith for that. So let me get back to what I said at the beginning. You have faith. That's why you're here today. But the reason the devil keeps kicking your butt in that one area is because you have no faith for that area. And we all got it. We all got it. So don't, don't trip. Don't be nervous. We all got it. So it's going to take prayer and fasting for that thing. Okay. Same story from Mark 9 in Matthew 17. Y'all still with me? Y'all still love me? Overflow, y'all still love me? I hope y'all still love me. I'm going to go preach to y'all if you don't. Okay. Um, Matthew 17, Jesus doesn't just say they're faithless. Look what he says. He says, he says, you faithless and perverse generation. OMG. <laughs> Jesus keeping it real on a Sunday night, okay? When, when he says perverse, this isn't like a word like, um, uh, like perverted. Here's what he's really saying in the Greek. You're too carnal. You're too sensual. You're, you're, you're too connected to your five senses. So you have no faith, faithless, and you're perverse. You're too sensual. Okay. Here was his antidote to this, prayer and fasting. Because prayer, check out the next slide, prayer connects me to God. Fasting disconnects me from the world. Okay? This is why prayer and fasting is important, because they have to go together. We don't, we don't hate the world. We don't hate our lives. We love life. We enjoy life. I just got home from a, from a European vacation where we ate more croissants than our body weight. I love my life. We enjoy our life. We love our family. We love fine things. We, uh, but there are times where you actually have to disconnect from the world yeah, and get alone with God and build your faith in God and in the spirit and you turn off the news and you turn off the music and you turn off the podcast and you turn off the TV shows and you turn off all the worldly stuff and you push back the plate and you seek God and the only thing you can hear is your voice and the worship music playing and your stomach growling. Come on, somebody. And you go after God and you get alone with God and in that moment you disconnect from the world and you tell your, your flesh, you tell your earth suit, you're not the boss of me. And my five senses are not the end all. There is a supernatural realm. There is another place. There is, a, there is a place in the spirit where I have authority in God. And so I go beyond my five senses and I go to a spiritual place of prayer and fasting. And I'm no longer sensual or faithless, but now I'm faith filled. I'm spirit filled and I'm spirit led. And now I'm not moved by feelings, I'm moved by the leading of the Holy Spirit. This only happens according to Jesus by prayer and fasting. Wow. You don't fast without prayer. That's a really bad diet. 
And you should always pray. The Bible says pray without ceasing, not fast without ceasing. Yeah, eventually you got to eat. Yeah. You pray without ceasing, but then sometimes you add that supernatural touch to it. It's called fasting. You, you take your prayer to a new place. Okay. Let me tell you what, faith, what, what fasting does quickly. Number one, fasting releases wisdom and direction for what is ahead. Anybody need a word from God? Anybody need wisdom? Could anyone use a little more direction? Okay, pray and fast. Javen, pray for me. No, go pray and fast. <sighs> Acts, Acts 13, Acts 13 says this. The apostles were praying about their next move in ministry. So they prayed and they fasted and they worshiped. Verse two says, and they heard from the Holy Spirit set apart Paul and Barnabas for the ministry. They didn't do it until they got a word from God. They didn't get a word from God till they fasted. Do you need a word from God for your teenager? Do you need a word from God for your marriage? Do you need a word for God for, for your business? Do you need a word from God for your next career move? Do you need a word from God for what should I buy a house? Should I not buy a house? Should I pray and fast? Pray and fast, amen. Pray and fast. And you get a word from heaven and the, the spiritual cloud and the, the, that fogginess lifts. And you can see clearly your next move. You do this by prayer. You don't do it by feeling. You do it by prayer and fasting. Okay, here's another one. Fasting empowers repentance. There's a lot of people in this room right now that you feel really guilty about something you're doing, but you can't get free from it. You need to fast. You need to fast. Here, here's why. Because... Fasting empowers the, like you feel guilty, but fasting will empower the repentance. Joel chapter one, God says, repent and fast. First Samuel chapter seven, Samuel calls a group of men together and he says, we're gonna repent and we're gonna fast. And it's like God empowers your desire for repentance as you fast. When I fast, I'm not earning anything. I'm not changing God's mind about anything. I'm not convincing God of anything. I'm not moving God, I'm moving me. I'm not changing God's mind, I'm changing my mind. I'm not convincing God, I'm convincing me. I'm not twisting God, I'm going on a hunger strike. <laughs> I'm not convincing. I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm telling my, myself, I'm taking this very seriously. And God honors that. Okay. Lastly, fasting. Come on up, Zach. Fasting speeds up answers. Wow. Y'all ready for this? Isaiah 58, 8 and 9. Isaiah 58 is the fasting chapter of the Bible. So I'd encourage you to read it this week, Isaiah 58. Here's what he says. As you fast, watch this. As you fast, then... Your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Praise the Lord. Everyone say a quick work. Quick come on, everyone say a quick work. a quick work. Your godliness will lead you forward. Do you feel like you're going backwards? Pray and fast. Do you feel like you're stuck in park? Pray and fast. Do you feel like you're, you're going left and right but not forward? Pray and fast. Because your godliness, your fasting will move you forward. Okay. And the glory of the Lord will protect you you from behind then you will call the Lord will answer yes I am here he will quickly reply anybody annoyed when they're left on red come on somebody amen everybody we know you saw it just just tell me you got it <laughs> listen God I'll take a no just let me know we're talking God, I'll take a wait. Just let me know we're in communication. God, I'll take an open door or a hold on. I'm about to do something. Just give me anything, God. Just let me know we're in communication. God says, if you will pray and fast, you will get quick answers, quick replies, and you will know that we are in communication. All right. So, all right, preacher, what are we doing? 
7.20 Sunday night. We're going on a 40-day water fast starting right now. No, we're not. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the next two Wednesdays. Everyone say Wednesday. Okay, we're going to take the next two Wednesdays. And anyone who wants to can join me on a one day, Wednesday, and two Wednesdays back to back. I'm going to do a liquid fast. Now, here's what that means for me. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to have coffee because I have to have coffee to be a Christian. <laughs> Amen. I, you going to fast caffeine? No. <laughs> Never. I'm going to drink coffee. Throughout the day, I'm going to gauge it. If I really feel like I'm down, I might have a, a, some green juice. I might have a smoothie. But I'm going to drink a ton of water. And I might drink a little bit of coffee to get me going. And I might have a, a little bit of uh, juice throughout the afternoon if I, if I just need a little pick-me-up to get me through. And I'm going to do a liquid fast this Wednesday and the next Wednesday. And I'm going to do that two weeks in a row. Why not three weeks? Because the third week is Christmas. Hello. No, you know what? We're going to be spiritual. We're fasting Christmas. No, we're not. We're yeah, overflow. Uh, so for two Wednesdays, we're going to pray and fast. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 9, 12, and 6 p.m. I'm going to get on Facebook Live and Instagram Live simultaneously, and I'm going to lead you through prayer and fasting. And we're going to, we're going to push the plate away. And we're going to take the time we would normally take to eat and we're going to seek God. Jabin, I want to pray. I'm not ready to fast. Cool. Jabin, I don't know if I want to do this. Cool. I'm not, this is free will. No one's calling you Wednesday, checking on you, okay? No one's going to knock on your door. Jay's not coming to people's door. Hey, man, you, you got food in there? No, we're not. If we see you somewhere eating, we're not going to judge you. Or, oh, you're, oh, you're eating. Okay, wow. <laughs> we're not going to do that. <laughs> but we're gonna do, I'm going to do two weeks back to back, two Wednesdays back to back. I'd encourage you to join me. I want you to get three or four things that you're really believing God to do in your life. And we're going to pray for those things. And we're going to believe, we're going we're gonna to focus our faith on this thing, this kind, these very specific things. And we're going to believe God for supernatural answers, supernatural clarity, a, a new love for God like we've never had, revival in our hearts. Amen. We're going to do that for the next two weeks. That's, that's what we're going to do out of this. And I believe God's going to really, I believe we're going to get some big testimonies before 2020. I'm talking about some big things that are going to break through in our, in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, everyone. It's Jabin here. I'm praying that this video was a blessing to you. Now remember two things, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you're up to date with everything that we're doing here. And also, if City Light has been a blessing to you, why don't you hit that give button and give something to help us continue to take this message, not only to Las Vegas, but to the world. And we'll see you real soon.